camera, and I'll be on uh, later on. But right now, these people come from my hometown in uh, Mabo in Inverness County. This particular family, uh, I remember introducing uh, at, a, at a concert I had in Waikagama over 20 years ago, and some of them were crawling around on the floor at that time. I'm really old. And uh, that's right. I remember doing that song. Yeah. And uh, they're a wonderful traditional group from Mabu, Cape Breton. Please welcome the Rankin family. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. That's um, sung in the language of Gaelic. God is Gaelic, and, and it means my faithful fair one. <clears throat> We're going to do uh, an original Rankin tune now, written by my brother Jimmy, and it's called The Fisherman's Son. Going out to all the fishermen back home, fixing their nets and their traps. Fisherman's ways. I fished with my father in my young days. I learned the fine craft of the fisherman's trade. Just to pass to my son, so he'll do the same. The sea is my lifeline, the shore is my home. I didn't stay long I stay 
subject in the car. And if you don't like me, then leave me alone. And I'll go on singing my fisherman's song. Singing la, 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 la. La, 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 la. I'm a fisherman's son, got fisherman's ways. I fished with my father in my young days. I learned the fine craft of the fisherman's trade. Just to pass to my son, so he'll do the same. Singing la, 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 la. La, 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 la. Singing la. Thank you. Is, uh, is the Gaelic sort of just preserved in the songs? Is it still sort of a functional language? I wouldn't exactly call it a functional language at this point in time. Except we, for the older people. They're few and far between what we're finding. Mm -hmm. there's, there's a number of people here in the Boston area. Well, surprisingly language. enough, you find it more in isolated spots like Boston than you do. <laughs> or, or, like, there's a Culturally, South, there's a, for the Gales, Boston's uh, an isolated spot. Uh, yeah. And I don't mean that negatively. No, I no, mean no. that there's a, uh, there's a group of Cape Bretoners who would have immigrated to Boston, what, 50 or 60 uh, years uh, ago? Yes. And they have preserved their language because that was that was one of the bonds that kept they them keep together. In touch. They keep in touch among themselves. Yeah, the yeah. But I don't know if that was a bond necessarily in Cape Breton. In fact, a number of years ago, was discouraged. To, to, keep, uh -huh. to keep your cultural identity alive when you are away, right? Yeah. Yes, I, I would agree with that. So it's people were trying to... Your home. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. People were really trying to push sort of a, a trans-Canada identity? Well, see, I, I don't know if they're doing that anymore, but uh -huh. at one point, uh, I would have heard John Allen's mother talking about... That would have been 50 or 60 years ago when she first went to school. She was only five or six. And at that point in time, the schools refused to teach in Gaelic, so they taught only in English. And I think that was a major factor in discouraging the language. Uh -huh. Things like that, I don't know necessarily. Well, speaking of, of a living language, though, <coughs> until a few years ago, when Katie Ann Cameron, your next door neighbor, and Dan Rory, her, her brother, were still alive, they could talk in Gaelic all day long. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't passed down, that's the problem. It stayed with that generation. Like and so many families, they, they kept they kept the uh, Gaelic as a secret language for the adults. Yeah. So they could talk among Someone themselves. Someone else is referring to it as that. I, I don't and necessarily... And they didn't teach the children, partly because they wanted to be able to talk about the kids. <laughs> in front of the kids without the kids knowing, and partly because they thought they'd be holding them back to teach them something all that. I, I think that's a more... Uh, another factor there. I think that's the major factor. Mm -hmm. It's dissuaded. Because it wasn't it wasn't, it wasn't modern, accepted. It wasn't up to no, date, it, it wasn't what was happening. It was. Music that is performed um, and that comes from Cape Breton is influenced by various ethnic groups such as the Scottish and uh, the Irish. This is a song that uh, originated from Scotland but um, is performed from time to time by maritime groups and uh, it's uh, called Mary's Wedding. We're going to ask Natalie McMaster, who is also on the boat performing, um, a well-known maritime fiddler from Cape Breton, to help us in on this tune. <coughs> of course it's in my way, so just... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. 
Marvin Rowe, one row of four batteries ready. Over hill, waist up and down, we're to ring and crack the ground. Past the ceilings, through the town, all for the sake of body. Step the gaily on, we go, heel for heel and toe for toe. I'm a diamond row, one row of four batteries ready. Plenty herring, plenty meal, plenty peas to fill her creel. Plenty body barons as well, that's a toast for Marvin. for Natalie McMaster. All of us have had various teachers. Uh, I recall being taught in the Marble Parish Hall by two different teachers, uh, Mary Janet McDonald is her married name, uh, who hails from Cape Breton and is a renowned step dancer there, and also uh, the late father Angus McDonnell. He was, Angus Alec? Yeah, Alec yeah. Uh, he was famous in Cape Breton and the Maritimes for his step dancing. But the girls have had various teachers, and a lot they've picked up on their own. Uh -huh. Is it something that you learn sort of like every kid would learn, like in fourth grade, or you have to sort of go out and say, I really want to learn this? You have to. I mean, you know, is it something you learn like. It, it depends if, you know, how good like you, you want to arithmetic. When I was in third grade, everybody had to learn the tongue. <laughs> You know, this little black plastic thing. I mean, is it kind of like that in Canada? You know, it's, it's like in, in Michigan, nobody does anything like that, you know. I think it depends on the level of proficiency that you want. Uh -huh. Because if you grow up in a, in a family where there's a lot of music happening, step dancing sort of 
come goes with. The, yeah. Goes like everybody with. Everybody in the mom's <coughs> Yeah. The hop. Yeah. Yeah. The step. Yeah. Uh -huh. Yeah. But as you grow, as the steps grow more complicated, that's uh -huh. when you may want to go to a teacher uh -huh. and maybe pick up someone else's style and then develop uh -huh. your own. Is it? Are people adding new steps all the time? Yeah. We are by no means really, really good step uh -huh. dancers. We know basic steps. Uh -huh. If you went to Cape Breton, you'd see. Uh -huh. <laughs> Is there, is there a lot of competition? They have like step dancing champions of the island. Um, there's not a they don't compete. No, uh -huh. but there are different levels of excellence. Yeah. I guess. Yeah. Uh -huh. There's no formal competition. No. No. The best ones uh -huh. get invited to the big concerts to get uh -huh. up and dance uh -huh. on stage. Because uh -huh. I have seen, you know, people like in Massachusetts who are billed as step dancing champion of X. You know, has won this prize, but. Yeah, other places like seem to get into that, but they're uh -huh. not really into the competition uh -huh. factor. Well, Floyd LeClaire, one of the Acadian dancers <laughs> here on the boat, is currently the senior step dancing champion of Prince Edward Island. It just happens in Cape Breton, probably because there's just too many step dancers, uh -huh. they don't have a competition. Uh -huh. I think it would create bad feelings. Yes. Uh -huh. <laughs> yeah. I don't think it's necessary. I no. Uh -huh. I mean, it's part of your culture uh -huh. to compete and having a skill like that. They don't have fiddle contests in Cape Breton either. Really? No. Huh. They've tried it a few times. Too much of that feeling. Uh -huh. The other thing with step dancing is I don't know if it's so much uh, technical excellence as it is style. Mm -hmm. If you know anything about step dancing, you'll see that various step dancers have totally different styles. Mm -hmm. And that's sort of what makes them unique. You have beautiful style. It, only, it doesn't matter if you only have half a dozen steps. Yeah. I think you have that's great style and well executed. This might be a good time to introduce the people we have uh, so ably backing us up on piano because I forgot him yesterday, John Morris Rankin. John Morris will be playing a little bit of fiddle for you later on. Uh, on bass, hailing from Halifax, Nova Scotia, Mr. Bruce Phillips. Playing a little bit of banjo, maybe not in this set, but later on. And electric and acoustic guitar, hailing from Halifax also, Mr. Scott McMillan. <laughs> Playing drums, guitar, backup and lead vocals, Mr. Jimmy Rankin. <laughs> to my extreme left, <laughs> look, <laughs> look, looking so ravishing this morning. <laughs> Singing back up and lead vocals and step dancing, mean step dance, Miss Heather Rankin. <laughs> Standing right beside me, dressed in the ravishing pink, singing lead and back up vocals, Miss Cookie Carol Jean Rankin. And last but not least, the one and only, singing lead vocals, back up vocals, playing a mean tambourine, the one, the only. Raylene Rankin. <laughs> kind of anticlimactic. The station master looked all around along the track, both up and down. But the train could not be found For there was neither sight nor sound There was neither sight nor sound He walked on slowly to the station door Like so many times before Sunshine beam closed his eyes and dreamed a dream, drifted off into a Years ago, throughout 
this land. This line was laid by able men. But things are changed as time went by. Now people drive and people fly. People drive and people fly. The station master is long since gone. He faded off into the sun But the whistle shrill still lingers on In the hearts of everyone Every day from dusk till dawn The winds have changed forever grown Something stay and something Orange Day Whistle, thank you very much. <clears throat> well, we sort of approached the end of this set. We're going to do um, a medley of fiddle tunes that are that we put words to and diddly dums to. Uh, some of the tunes included in the medley are the old king's reel, the king's reel. <laughs> wasn't one of the tunes. Jimi Hendrix, uh, Trash Bass. Yeah. <laughs> the Bonniest Lass in All the World. And a couple of other ones that I'm sure all of you will recognize by name. It's called the Jigging Medley.
a cloud on high From John of Groats to the Isle of Sky Played every clan their slogan cry Rise and follow Charlie As she Thank you very much, and good afternoon, everybody. How is everybody in pretty good mood? Well, we'll take care of that. My name is John Allen Cameron. As I told everybody this morning, there were about three people in here at 9.30 this morning. Oh, my God, was it ever lonely up here. <laughs> it really was. That song was called Sound the Pibrach. Uh, it, it's from the life and times of Bonnie, Bonnie Prince Charlie. It's uh, 200 years old. And this is a contemporary song. It was written again by a friend of mine from Cape Breton, Alistair McGillivray. He wrote a, 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 a lovely song. They'll do song for the Myra again. That's going to come up later on. But he also wrote this song. And this is sort of a lovely up-tempo song because I'm sort of in the, in, sort of in the mood. Now I've been wheels and I've been raised. I've been dusty roads, grassy wagon trails. But I miss the friends that linger in the streets of my hometown. If you love me, you'll believe me. Tie me down. Tie me down. Tie me down. You know I never meant to play around. If you love me, you'll believe me. And I'll go with you now. But to love to give together. Tie me down. Now I know song is more than one. I've never done Once they branded me a devil Went along to be a clown If you love me, you'll believe me Tie me down Tie me down Tie me down You know I never meant to play around If you love me, you'll believe me And I'll go with you now But we got to get together Tie me down And if we swore, we changed no more 
nothing that our hearts would be good for. Give this some consideration before you turn around. If you love me, you'll believe me. Tie me down. Jack Starr, who managed the uh, the uh, the Horseshoe Tavern, uh, called up some of his friends in, uh, in in Nashville, and he said, "This particular guy deserves to be on the Grand Ole Opry," and they respected him Me so much. Me. Me and you. Moi. Yeah. <laughs> he said, "This this guy up here, and we'd like to get him on the Opry," and uh, and they took Jack's word because he was dealing with all the big acts from Nashville. So I went down there, drove down with Alistair McGilvery and David Eisner, and <laughs> here we are backstage at the old Ryman Auditorium, the old uh, it, it was the, uh, the sacred shrine. Yeah, yeah. and at, at at that time, uh, just across the street. Uh, at, at that time, uh, David Allen Cole was driving an old hearse, and he was sitting on top of the hearse playing his guitar <laughs> as the people were filing in to uh, to hear the opera. But I mean, you have to start somewhere, and that was his way. <laughs> so, so anyway, we, I, I, I noticed. I'll never forget this. Ernie Ashworth, God bless him. Ernie Ashworth had a, a big country hit out called "Talk Back Trembling Lips," <laughs> and, and he came out with this absolutely gorgeous cream colored uh, suit with red lips all over it. <laughs> Talk back written here, trembling lips. His head was written all over his body. <laughs> suit. And I said, well, if he has enough intestinal fortitude to wear that, I want to wear my kilt. So, so I came out in, in, in my kilt and I was sandwiched in between Roy Rogers and Hank Snow. <laughs> Here we have the the epitome of comic book greatness and the epitome of traditional country. I mean, I'm sandwiched in there and I'm wearing a kilt. And then Roy Acuff introduced me mm -hmm. and he's the king down there. Mm -hmm. And 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 I started I started up we're supposed supposed to do two and a half minutes. I said two and a half minutes everybody. And uh, so no I said, no, no exceptions. I said, listen, guys, in order for me to really uh, g gain something here, I must, uh, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll have to, maybe it'd be best to do a medley. So I went in there, and I started with a bagpipe tune. I think it was K Kitchener's Army March, just to give them a taste of the on bagpipes the on the 12-string guitar with Alistair and David. And one of the Nashville drummers just moved in there and he started playing. <laughs> And I immediately went from that into uh, the country up-tempo song called Anne, mm -hmm. which was uh, recorded by Glenn Campbell and uh, written by Billy Ed Wheeler, incidentally. Mm -hmm. uh, I like to give credit to songwriters. They're the unsung heroes of the industry. <laughs> In any case, uh, I finished that, and I couldn't believe the response from... 3,500 people in the theater. They went absolutely nuts. So Roy Acuff, in the, in the middle of uh, my song, Anne, he came out with his chair, and he sat in front of me, and he, and he was looking up at me. He said, who, who is this, more or less? <laughs> and then he said to me, uh, young man, do another. And I said, uh, sir, I was told to do uh, just one tune. And he said, do another, I'm telling you. So I did another song, and then, he came out, he put his hand on my shoulder, and he did a seven-minute interview, on, and, and that was on live WSM radio, which was all over the country. While well, it reached, uh, yeah. it was a clear channel. Yeah. And uh, that particular thing gave me so much wonderful confidence, because you were certainly not, were not singing to the converted, because when you perform, and the audience out there have absolutely no idea who you are, and you and you become a credible entity. Then, uh, as Hank Snow came up to me, he said, "Whatever you're doing, boy," he said, "keep doing it because it works." Well, when I was a little child growing up in the Inverness County in 
parish of Port Hood. <laughs> now that the Rankins are from Mabo, I will guess I'll say I'm from Port Hood. Uh, I used to hear people playing the fiddle like Scotty Fitzgerald and Bill Lamy and Angus Chisholm. And uh, I grew very fond of the fiddle music and the pipe music, and I started to play it on the, on the guitar. I remember the very first time I had a uh, concert in Toronto at the Riverboat on Yorkville Avenue. The guy in the Toronto Star had a write-up. He said, how can you really believe somebody who plays Celtic music on the 12-string guitar? Is that a credible entity or not? Well, I'm still around playing it, and that guy is long gone because traditional music, uh, because of its very longevity, means that people can certainly relate to, to it for all time. In fact, all kinds of music. Anyway, this uh, tune called The Bonnie Lass of Bon Accord, uh, written a couple of hundred years ago by James Scott Skinner, and I'll put some jigs onto it.
Thank you very much. What kind of songs were you doing? I was, mainly it was the influence of the Clancy Brothers at that time and Tommy Makem. I uh, used to do a song that was quite popular, and they started playing my version all the time. They didn't play the uh, the uh, Clancy Brothers version, The Juice of the Barley. Mm. That became very, very popular. Well, John Allen would often edit in some local references. He'd mm -hmm. take a place name in Ireland, take for that example, out, throw the, in something from yeah, West County. Yeah, the old woman of, well. uh, from Wexford became the old woman from Mabu. And, I mean, that is an integral part of oral tradition. Purists, <laughs> purists would say, yeah, it, it is not the pristine purity. In, it, it, the song wasn't ordained to be this. I say balderdash. That's uh, oral tradition. Like I, I, I studied it and 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 uh, I localized it. If you want to say the old woman from Wexford, go right right ahead. Everybody knows it was based on that. Yeah. And I mean, uh, look at a, quite quite a few songs that we know. Uh, the uh, New Christian Min Minstrels had a song out called Denver. Da 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 Based on Rolls and the Bow. Mm -hmm. Bobby Bear had a song out called Come Kiss Me Love, a big hit. And it was based on a lovely Scottish song called Peggy Gordon. And so you dug out the original ha. and had a big hit with it. Uh -huh. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then it was uh, very interesting uh, a little later on. I might be jumping ahead a little bit, but uh, I must give... I, uh, probably the biggest song I had at that time when I was first starting and I had just graduated from the university. I was about to make my first record. I was passing through uh, Boston and I went to see uh, my friends in Arlington, uh, Marjorie and Herbie McLeod. And uh, Marjorie was just a great lady and, uh, and uh, she said, you're going to make a record. Did you ever hear this song? And she played uh, an obscure version uh, uh, of a song called The Four Marys. And I said, I really Isn't love it. Mary Hamilton. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, th then we uh, took the words down, and I went on to Montreal, and I recorded it, and it became virtually the national anthem down there. Everybody did it, and uh, it it treated me very, very well. And when it hold, I mean, the song was around for 500 years, and it can certainly it was, I don't know, that was tw over 25 years ago, and and I still do it, and people respond. There were four Marys beside the beaver tree. There was Mary Satan and Mary Beaton and Mary Carmine and me. Oh, little did my mother think when first she craved.
bless you, Marjorie. I wonder if I have time to go to Marietta. As long as we have kids taking up the fiddles. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's It'll no, be all right. There's no problem <laughs> about that. There was a bit of a scare a few years ago, but that's well taken care of. And um, I'm happy. I think it was in on the ground floor of yeah, its will. revival. And uh, You've done a lot to help the youngsters come along. Well, that's rather, that's rather important. When, when I had, uh, later on in, 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 uh, in, in the mid-'70s, I had a national television show, which included Jerry Holland, Winston Scott, if you know, Gerald Angus Chisholm, and my brother John Donald, and uh, Wilford Gillis, and, and, uh, and that's nice. And mm. some, uh, I, ha I had Ukrainian gr dance groups. I had uh, uh, French-Canadian dance groups, and I had Acadian dance groups and, uh, as uh, guests. And, uh, and, and that's important because there, we all should be proud of our heritage mm. and just perform from there. Right. One, two, three. <laughs> To mortal blow, and the Mary Ellen Carter settled the war. There was just a smile of older when she finally was awash. We worked like hell to save her, all heedless of the cost. And the groan she gave as she went down across the stoop of the lane, that the Mary Ellen Carter would rise again.
very much. Thank you. There's app work coming up with the Ceylon band next. No? The, oh, the Highland dancers and all the dancers and all of that. Is that what's coming up? That's wonderful. Thank you all. You're a great audience. <laughs> Thank you. Now get me in here for a concert. <laughs>